Blog Talk Radio. Hello, and welcome to Work Trends with Megan M. Biro. Whether you're here to network, learn, or share, we want you to have fun. During this live broadcast and Twitter chat, we'll discuss the future of work with smart and entertaining guests who value today's business and its impact on the world of work for the future. Stay tuned, because we start in 3, 2, 1. And happy February, everybody. Welcome to another informative Talent Culture Work Trends live podcast and Twitter chat. I'm over here in Cambridge, feeling like a Canterbridgean. It's, it, there is snow on the ground, by the way, which is kind of a miracle. Um, life is good, right? Welcome. I'm glad we're all here to uh, talk to each other today to catch up. I want to thank my sponsors and my friends and our community who make all this possible to do this every week. Um, these are interesting times, as we know, um, from a variety of perspectives, politically, right, I think is a, is a biggie right now. Um, and today's topic is, is, is an important one. It's a hot one. Um, and it's one that we've covered in the past. And, you know, I'm going to continue to cover this topic into the future because I think it matters. Um, I don't think it's always an easy topic, and that's okay. You know, that's why we're here, um, to kind of unfold and hear different frames of a view on this. Um, what I love about today's topic is how our guests, Rob Cahill and Suzanne Leong, Discuss it from a perspective of how a diverse workforce is not only a business imperative, but it's kind of a moral and ethical obligation that companies should want to observe. Um, bold statement for sure, so we want to uncover this and understand where Rob and Suzanne are coming from on this. This means that companies probably need to wake up and smell the coffee and realize we're becoming a workforce of one on a global scale, right? And with that, I think brands and companies and leaders and, and people in general who realize this today are setting a future of talent alignment that probably coincides more with the business goals of the organization. So um, if you're out there on work trends, thanks for being here. Utilize that hashtag uh, for some conversation today. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce you to today's guest. We've got Rob Cahill. He's the CEO and co-founder of Jana. And Jana provides bite-sized performance support for first-level managers to build the skills they need to hire, develop, and retain great people. Before that, he was with Sunrun as chief of staff to the founder. And before that, he was a consultant at McKinsey & Company. He earned an MS in management science and a BA in economics at Stanford University. And we have Suzanne Leung. She's the VP of sales at Jana. And... Suzanne gets a huge kick out of building stuff. So let's find out a little bit more about what she means by that. That's kind of broad. We're interested to learn a little more. Um, but that's why she loves driving business growth for the company as well as people development. She spent six years in the educational tech space, and she's passionate about innovative technologies that make a social impact. So welcome, Rob and Suzanne. Um, before we get started into the diversity topic specifically, I really want to hear a little bit more about you, Rob, and then we can move it over to Suzanne. Great. Well, thank you, Megan, for hosting us today, and thank you uh, to the community and listeners. We're really looking forward to this discussion, uh, both uh, the podcast part and then the discussion online. I, I believe this topic is a critical one, an important one, so glad to have the space to cover it. So I'm, I'm Rob, uh, as Megan shared, uh, co-founder, CEO at Jana, uh, which we started uh, about five and a half years ago with a mission to help millions of people get the great manager they deserve. We do that through modern online learning resources. Uh, we believe, as I think many people who have been managers know, that managers are linchpins in organizations. They can help drive success. They can also, if not properly prepared, can, uh, can lead to failure and real challenges for organizations. And similarly, managers have a lot of control over diversity and fairness within the workforce uh, at their company. So we, that's something we're gonna talk a lot more about today, share some of our examples. Uh, this is a fast moving field too, so we, we don't have all the answers and wanna keep the conversation going. Uh, about me personally, cool. uh, I'm a, 
<laughs> I'm a fifth generation San Franciscan, which is unusual for San Francisco because there's so many new people who have come here. Uh, my great great grandfather came on a boat from Dublin to San Francisco, which is a really long boat ride. I don't know any why anyone Holy would ever cow. want to do that. Yeah, back in the with 1800s. a Guinness in hand, we hope. Probably. We hope somebody yeah. was actually having fun doing that. You know what I mean? Well, he switched from a Guinness to an anchor steam, I think, when he got here. <laughs> it, it's um, so rare, Rob, to actually be fifth generation there. I was going to say, like, Rob, where do you hail from originally? Because it's such a literally a melting pot these days. You know, most most of the time when I'm in San Francisco, I'm meeting and hanging out with people that are from somewhere else. So that's kind of a cool factoid. Yeah. And, it's, you know, our company, we support managers and we support tens of thousands of managers all over the world now. So we're based here, but we do have a remote workforce. We have a lot of people on our team from different areas and support people across, all across the country and all across the world. Um, I, I would say, what too, as we start your, the Let me ask you, Rob, while we're on that topic, what's your headcount right now? We're 26 full-time employees. Nice. So everybody knows each other <laughs> <laughs> yeah. for better or worse, yeah, it's, right? It's a, yeah, it's a fun phase. And a, a part of the impetus for starting Jana originally was I got to manage people for the first time at my previous company at Sunrun. Uh, and they were, when I joined, they were 15 people smaller than Jana today. And they're now a public company with thousands of employees and saw the importance of good management really? and also how, how hard it was to do well. Yeah. It's it's remarkably hard to be a good manager. <laughs> I mean, it just is. That's why we have, um, you know, many more weeks to uncover this topic, right? And we've been doing this. I've been podcasting for several years, and it's just it's amazing, you know, how difficult when you really get down to the nuts and bolts it is. Um, let me ask you a question. How did you how did you come up with the company name? Because it's rather unique. Sure. Well, it's a Sanskrit word for knowledge. Uh, and so we, and we've always imagined, you know, when you calculate how many bad managers there are in the world, there's probably, probably hundreds of millions of people work for bad managers, making their yeah. lives at work and lives outside of work a lot worse. So we, we, we wanted a name that reflected that global goal of helping millions of people get a great manager. I find Rob in my adventures here that oftentimes when people start companies and they build products, um, sometimes it comes from maybe a bad experience along the way, right? That is, there's an impetus there that goes, I have to stop this now. Was you, was there something in your career path that led you here? Um, and it could be positive, it could be negative, but you know, sometimes I do find there's that negative thing, right? Talk to us a little bit about that. Sure. Well, I uh, started it with a coworker from who I'd worked uh, at McKinsey with, and you know, I look back in my career, my uh, my my past, and I studied management science and engineering. I became a management consultant. There's something about the word management that keeps drawing me back. Uh, but you know, for myself and my co-founder, we both did struggle learning how to manage for the first time. And I, I think for me, the stronger the stronger experience was. Uh, well, it was, there were two experiences. One, having the uh, manager who I, I learned so much from and was a mentor to me, helped guide my own development. Uh, and then also had a manager I just could not, I just could not stand working mm -hmm. for. It was awful, miserable, frustrating, yeah. wanted to quit. And he, when you feel that, that pain and that emotion working for someone who's a bad mm -hmm. boss, then you, it makes you want to do something yeah. to fix it. Absolutely. Well, listen, I also want to welcome Suzanne. Um, tell us a little bit more about yourself. Yeah. Thank you, Megan. I'm Suzanne. As uh, you mentioned, I'm the VP of sales here. I actually started at Jana three years ago as employee number seven, was a second salesperson, and um, spent some time as an account executive here, then moved into a management role, managing for the first time as well. I was a business development uh -huh. manager, built our our business development team, and then last year moved into heading up the whole sales team. Um, I'm also an immigrant. It's an important part of who I am from a diversity and sort of a, a self-identity point of view. Uh, my parents mm -hmm. are from Hong Kong. I grew up in Singapore, and when I was 18 years old, graduated from high school in Singapore and moved to the U.S. by myself. 
and uh, went yeah. to Knox College. And then after graduation, I moved to San Francisco. And this is where, honestly, I feel the most at home, the city. And it's largely mm-hmm. because of the diversity here where I feel like I really fit in. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. I, I feel that when I'm in San Francisco. There is an energy there that is, uh, you, you can feel that, literally. There's something yes. about it. And I love that, you know, you've had these different cultural experiences. I think it guides so much of, of who we are and how companies develop what we call a personality, right? A culture. Yes. So exactly. very interesting. Um, well, listen, let's dive in. I'll start with Rob. Tell us more about why a diverse culture is a moral issue. Tell us just a little bit more about this, as much as it is, of course, a business decision for any brand. Yes. Yeah, and I, there's, a, there's a lot of research out there that shows that diverse workforces lead to better financial results, having a diverse board, diverse leaders, diverse team members, you get better ideas, and that leads to better results. That's well known. But what, isn't, what people often don't think about is the fundamental fairness that diversity and, and inclusivity promote. You know, I, I come from a privileged background. I'm a white guy named Rob who's a CEO of a company. You know, the top five mm-hmm. highest earning names in the U.S., Rob is one of them. I got to go oh, to Stanford. Really? I got to work at McKinsey. Yeah, and so I had, uh-huh. had all these advantages, and it probably helped me in my career. But then there are people who, yeah. because of their, their name or where they're from or their background, they don't have the, those advantages, and it makes it harder for them to be rewarded like they should be. So to create mm-hmm. a true meritocracy, you need to promote diversity, inclusivity, and you need to remove unconscious bias. We have a lot of stories about that here internally that we've faced, uh, and I, we're, we're excited to be sharing them. But we, we do believe that it's that inclusivity and diversity, promoting those can help change the world and make it a better, fairer place. Suzanne, I'm going to move this over to you. How can companies that have not had a diverse workplace learn the benefits and processes to actually become one? You know, and what does that mean to you to become that yeah. right yeah, now? I have, I have a lot of personal experience thinking about this, wrestling with it. What I'll say is start with what you can impact. You know, don't wait for some diversity committee to start things. Don't wait for some strategic initiative. Don't wait for HR. You know, people at like Donna here, they know I love this phrase, go rogue, where you just do it. Just don't wait for permission. Go just do it. And yeah. so to give you an example, when I was promoted to business development manager, and that was the first time I managed people, I was hiring people for the first time. One of the first small but important things that I did was I removed the bachelor's degree requirement from our job description for business development reps because as I you know really thought about it, the mm-hmm. BD reps don't need a degree to do that job well. And so that change was the first small step that I could control as a hiring manager towards creating a more inclusive hiring process. Um, There are other things we did. So, for example, we uh, moved completely away from using outside recruiters to source candidates. And the reason we did that was it was it was clear that from my perspective, they were screening out diverse candidates, perhaps due to unconscious bias, but the candidates we were getting really just all looked the same. Um, And so now we are more proactive in seeking out hiring sources where we can find candidates from underrepresented groups. Um, One concrete example is uh, a Google group that Our current BD manager now was invited to, and I think you can search for it online, it's called Young Black NSF or YBSF. It's an online forum and listserv. And we found great candidates there. Um, We actually hired one of our current BDRs, Sidero, from that group. And um, there's just a ton of amazing but overlooked talent. And if you just do a little bit of work, a little bit of small change, it all adds up into, at the end of the day, when you look back, a tidal wave of change for your company in terms of diversity. 
Yeah, and I, Suzanne, if I, can pile I just want to say, yeah, I just, I just want to kind of in, in, interject here as somebody who I'm a former recruiter, so I wore a recruiter hat for many years in the high tech space as an agency recruiter and then did some consulting work on the RPO side. I do think there's a place for recruiters, though. Let's, let's, let's unfold that just a little bit because it sounds to me like you're saying there's no room for recruiting in your model because of X, Y, Z. Were you working with an outside agency or was this internal recruiters? Just educate the audience just a little bit more on, on what that was yeah. for you all. And I'm not saying there's not a right or wrong. Everyone, every culture is unique in how they decide to, you know, put, put a recruiting plan in place. But I just want to hear a little bit more about that. Sure. It was an outside recruiting firm. We used two outside recruiting firms. And I had actually given them feedback. I said, look, I am committed to getting more diverse candidates. Please, uh, candidates mm-hmm. who are not your fresh out-of-college grad for a, a, a BDR, um, which typically it's an entry-level re- role. You know, I'm open to Got seeing it. people Got it. have some experience. I'm looking for people who don't necessarily have a, a bachelor's degree. I'm looking for more ethnic diversity. But yet I was still getting the same – same type of candidate, mm-hmm. which okay. was a white. Got so, it. Um, and so, you know, from what, you know, going back to control what I can control, it was hard for me to control yeah. outside. So obviously it'd be great if I could help to shift their criteria or mm-hmm. maybe even help them to understand some of the unconscious bias happening, but that's harder for me to control. What I could control right. was, thinking outside of the box in terms of where I was sourcing. That makes sense. And I think it's actually really cool of taking that tack of you, you don't need a bachelor's degree for sales. That is a unique angle, and I'm, I'm, I find it refreshing, actually. Um, Rob, I'm going to move this over to you because I was reading one of your articles about diversity, and I applaud you for this statement. I hold the leadership team accountable for an inclusivity goal every quarter. It's right up there with our product, revenue, and marketing goals. Tell us just a little bit more about this and how you've risen to the occasion to actually support that. Sure. So we, on our company dashboard, our top goals, we, every quarter we have one inclusivity related goal. Uh, And the reason we decided that was important was because we set inclusivity as one of our four company values. This is, we put a, a stake in the ground. This is something we believe in. But it can be hard with company values for them to become real. So how do you activate that value and make it be part of your culture, not just something that's written up on the wall? And this was this is one of the ways to do it. Uh, and, you know, the reason this came about was it wasn't my great idea. It was because of people at the company who are passionate about inclusivity and diversity and wanted to make sure that we were doing everything we could as a company. And we have a we have a diversity impact team like a committee uh, we have people who are doing things like Suzanne shared, going rogue, making things happen, changing how we hire. But we also wanted to show that we support this at an executive leadership team level at the same time. So I think it's just it's the I'll, there's a lot of research on how to overcome biases yeah. and to build a truly diverse organization. And a lot of it is around education and awareness. So having that goal up there. And a lot of the, the, what we do internally are education and awareness events. So the more you can help people see where they might be missing or what their biases might be, the better, the better performance, better mm-hmm. diversity, better activity you can have. Yeah, and I think it's a brave move to actually open up this communication around it. So often, you know, there's just not enough people talking about it in a real way, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, people often ask, you know, when when should we get started? Maybe we're too early to do this. It, you know, it, it seems so difficult. And what, what I would say is it's it's never too early to start. Uh, I think as soon as you start to build an organization that is a homogenous, just one type of people, it can be really hard to break mm-hmm. that mold. And why would someone yeah. from a different background want to go into that homogenous group? And it's it's pervasive, especially in technology. You uh Right. There's a lot of talk about diversity, but it's still a typically homogenous group. And, you know, there's, there's this feeling yep. that there's a war on talent. There are only a few good candidates out there. But that's because we're only looking for certain archetypes, which tend to be, mm-hmm. tend to be white, tend to be male, 
tend to be from top colleges, and it, it can be hard to break that. So if you have the ability to hire people in your organization, I would strongly recommend finding ways to diversify that pool uh, and the people at your company as early as possible. Makes sense. Suzanne, as a woman in a leadership role at Yana, or Jana, I should say, with an H, tell me how these numbers resonate with you. Women account for an average of 16% of executive teams in the U.S., 12% in the U.K., 6% in Brazil, and remain underrepresented at the top corporations globally still. Yeah, what do these numbers tell me? Um, It tells me that there is a ton of overlooked talent out there. And I want to echo what Rob just talked about in terms of this notion of a war on talent. I really want to challenge that notion because it assumes that there is a small, finite pool of good talent and there's not enough to go around. The reality Mm -hmm. is, is that there is awesome but overlooked talent out there, and it's just not packaged in the way that you might be Mm -hmm. accustomed to. So, for example, when I and my my close colleague, Kristen Moore, she now heads our business development team, we first started taking some of those steps I talked about towards creating a more inclusive hiring practice. We started getting candidates who were amazing, seriously so driven, so talented, yet no other companies were going after them. They were having a really Hmm. hard time getting interviews, getting past that first phone screen, um, you know, even getting their resume accepted. So, you know, honestly, I remember it felt like, oh, my God, Kristen, we've stumbled on this secret treasure treasure chest of talent. And these candidates who are incredible but overlooked, and we were like, you know, this, yep. this guy is amazing, we, but we'd ask him, okay, so who else are you interviewing it with, right? Thinking, okay, we've got to get an offer out to him soon. There must be a ton of people wanting to give him offers. And they'd say something like, you know, it's just been hard to get an interview. And it's because when we look at their background, it wasn't f- fitting that mold. Um, so, you know, when I hear about statistics like that, about the yeah. lack of women in leadership or statistics on any underrepresented group for that matter – I immediately think, okay, that group is overlooked talent. If you're smart enough to tap into that, Mm -hmm. you're going to get a competitive advantage. Absolutely. you got to be creative, right? It's all about staying open-minded in the recruiting process, right? Seeing people, as I like to say, in 3D, um, not taking that resume at face value. It's so dangerous to do that. It's so important to humanize people you know, to get in front of that person, uh, whether it be video or for coffee, um, and really get to know who they are, not only as a resume and a skill set, but as a person. Um, So that resonates with me, certainly, and I'm sure it does for, you know, certain people in our audience as well. It's important to stay open-minded, and I think a lot of people give that lip service, and they're not really doing that. And so looking beyond the resume uh, is what we're really talking about right here, you know. Exactly. So in an yeah. article by, yeah, I'm moving on because we're like, we're, we're like 23 minutes into this conversation. <laughs> I tell you, time, time's flying. Um, in an article by McKinsey and Company, it was cited that companies in the top um, percentage for racial and ethnic diversity are 35% more likely to have financial returns above their respective national industry medians. This is big and an attention grabber for most people in leadership. Given this financial advantage, why are so many companies not even paying attention to this? Like, where are we missing yeah. the boat on this? It's, it's surprising. Uh, and, and we were thinking about, we've been thinking about this question for a while, and it's hard to really know why, because there's so many clear benefits, yet it's not happening. And I, I think... I think part of it is that a lot of the people running these organizations are people who look like me with my background and experience who have had, have had all the advantages. And so mm-hmm. you know, as a result, it's hard to see, and it, it's even been hard for me. You know, my team has had to help educate me on some of the things I couldn't see myself. And so I, I mm-hmm. think a lot of people. Like what? Of, Give us an example. Well, like, for example, uh, you know, the, 
uh, Suzanne was talking about removing the bachelor's degree as a requirement. Or, you know, another example is when you've only worked for white male leaders, you start to think of that as the archetype of a leader. But that's not the only type of great leader out there. But, you know, you might assume mm -hmm. that the right way to run a sales meeting or to develop your team or to give feedback is how those white men did it. And so I, you know, I, and thinking to yourself, wow, that's not what I would do, may not be the right way to go. Uh, so what, you know, what I would recommend for organizations is try to get some leaders in there who, have, who are from different archetypes, people on your board, mm -hmm. uh, people in the executive team. I think HR has a big role to play here in helping connect people to mentors who come from different backgrounds and experiences. And then you break down those biases and you see that it gives you strength. But in, until that happens, it can be slow to change. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about the telltale signs of a culture that understands how diversity is well-developed as a business driver. Suzanne, you may want to jump in here. Sure. You know, I would say start with hiring. And, you know, granted, it's hard for me to, to tell what those telltale signs are looking from the inside. But one indicator that I think is real is when – I hear from interview candidates telling me about their experience after interviewing. Even if they didn't get the job, they'll say things like, everyone was so welcoming. Or I felt like I was able to share something about myself, something I don't usually share in interviews. I felt like I could really be myself. And if you're mm -hmm. a minority and you come out of an interview process feeling like you could really be you, that you could see mm -hmm. yourself company, I think that is at the most kind of visceral, emotional level, a, a good sign mm -hmm. that there's something going on in that company that's, that's going right. Makes sense to me. Rob, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, like Suzanne said, I would look at the hiring process. If I wanted to figure out if a company cared about diversity or not, I would go talk to the recruiters and talk to the hiring managers and ask, how do you source candidates? What does the pool look like? How do you ensure diversity? How do you remove bias from your interview questions and projects along the way? You know, and, and Megan, you're bringing up the point around recruiters. I think recruiters have a huge role to play here. I mean, the diversity I do is- I too, by is, the way. And the, and the, one thing that, yeah. the one thing I do want to hear you both say is we need to build up HR and we need to build up recruiting. And we need to not only have the board of directors and, and the executive team involved, make this a business imperative make that recruiter feel like they're part of a bigger mission right i think so often and even when i wore a recruiting hat i kind of felt like out of the queue with the leadership culture on some level it was like you know these are your goals meet the goals but we're not going to really give you that level of power to make those decisions on culture when oftentimes it is the recruiter who's selling the culture and now yeah. more than ever, you need to be honest about that. And in order to be yeah. honest about the culture, you got to make recruiters in HR your, your business partner in that, right? Get everybody, well, I would, you know, there. I, I would even flip that, Megan, saying, you know, in some way, you just you don't want to wait for the senior leadership to make changes happen because that'll just be too slow. And I, I think of as yeah. an example – Suzanne started hiring for Jana. She, her goal was to grow sales. It wasn't, it, I didn't give her a goal to promote diversity or improve our hiring process. And so how did she build the, to find the courage to spend all the time? Cause it's harder to run a more inclusive, unbiased hiring process. How did she find the time? Yeah. Not to put words in your mouth, Suzanne, <laughs> but I think it's because she <laughs> saw that promoting inclusivity and diversity is the right thing to do. It's the fair thing to do. And it also helps business results. So I would, I would say to recruiters, don't wait. Start now. You have the control in the yeah. organization, and that will lead to change. Yep. Well, listen, this was a really great discussion. Um, thank you both. We're ready to wrap this up. But uh, in closing, tell us briefly, we've got a couple more minutes here about your 2017 plans. You know, it's, it's really exciting, the foundation that we started in in hiring and diversity here and it's not just about 
bringing the people in the door. It's really about fostering that culture. And so as I think about 2017, how can we really take that to the next level and drive an inclusive culture for the people who are here and, and make all types of people feel like they belong? And, and that's where retention really starts um, to, to make an impact. So it's not just about recruiting, but it's about retaining them as well. Um, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to that this year. Excellent. Well, on, thank you both. Let's oh. uh, continue this conversation. <laughs> Rob, we're, why don't we continue this conversation on Twitter? We're out of time. Perfect. Great discussion. Thank you, Megan. Thanks, Megan. Thanks, everybody.